All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. This is the second course here uh, that we're holding this week on resource adequacy. Um, this training series was made possible with funding from the US Department of Energy's Grid Deployment Office. And uh, again, the first two courses were developed through a collaboration between NARUC and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, we're digging into a wide, away, wide array of resource adequacy topics. And I wanna thank uh, Juliet Homer uh, at PNNL, who's been really instrumental in pulling this together with some excellent speakers. Uh, part one of this series was on Tuesday. If you missed it, the presentations have already been posted. Uh, thanks to my CPI colleagues for getting those up so quickly. Um, and the recordings from Tuesday will also be posted uh, probably in the next week or so. Uh, today, we're gonna address part two of resource adequacy. Uh, and then next Tuesday, you're gonna hear from us. Um, if you can join us, we'll have a final course that looks at um, generator interconnection processes. And we've teamed up with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for that one. Uh, this is not the first time we've done this. We uh, had another series earlier this year. We partnered with uh, the Energy Systems Integration Group or ESIG. Um, and we covered integration of utility scale storage, electrification and load forecasting, uh, energy adequacy and capacity accreditation. And then uh, earlier um, in 2021, we did another series. Um, and so all those recordings and presentations are available on our website that you used uh, to register for this uh, course today. And it's also on the slide here. Uh, the entire effort has really been put together uh, with consideration for the regulatory community. We want to ensure that the available tools and information um, are there for you as you navigate the ongoing transition of our evolving electricity system in your respective states. Um, so if you have any feedback or suggestions, um, if you like have any ideas on, on uh, topics we can explore in the future, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is at the bottom of the page. I'd also like to highlight that uh, NARUC's Center for Partnership and Innovation recently released a resource adequacy report. Uh, we teamed up with about 15 other commissions and um, you know, we, uh, we really covered a wide array of topics on how states are involved in resource adequacy processes. Uh, we looked at regional resource adequacy and we also looked at ongoing enhancements um, to the metrics and planning practices uh, to try and sort of align our uh, tools with the changing uh, resource mix. So looking at today's schedule and, and logistics, we're again very excited to hear from our four distinguished presenters and experts in their respective fields. We'll introduce each of them before they begin. And then uh, during the presentation, we invite all the participants to use the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll try and address any clarifying questions throughout the presentations, and then we'll hold the more uh, substantive or technical questions until the end. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Dr. Nathalie Voison with PNNL. She's going to be talking about um, what I think is a really uh, a challenge that's only going to become more significant as we see uh, different states uh, implementing their various um, energy policies and the impacts on the resource mix. Um, but she's going to be specifically talking about um, hydroelectric availability and how it impacts uh, the rest of the Western interconnection. And then we're going to hear from Dr. We Do, uh, also with PNNL. Uh, Dr. Do is going to discuss regional planning considerations, particularly with regard to inverter-based resources. Many of you may have heard of the terms of grid forming and grid following. Uh, Dr. Do is going to discuss the modeling approaches around grid forming inverters. Uh, at 2.10, we're going to take a short break. We'll come back for the second part uh, of today's course. And we're excited to hear from Juliet Homer. She's going to discuss the interplay between resilience and resource adequacy. And when you're planning a system, you kind of have some built-in re resilience um, when you're doing things like planning reserves and fuel diversity and, and um, imports and, and firm capacity transfers. But Juliet's going to dig into more detail on that topic. If you haven't already seen it, um, Highly recommend you take a look at PNNL's recent report. It's Emerging Best Practices for Electric Utility Planning and Climate Variability. Um, it's a great resource. It explores what states and others are doing um, to create more resilient systems. Finally, we're going to hear from Jeremy Twitchell, also with PNNL. He's going to discuss how uh, energy storage is being used as a transmission asset. Um, I think uh, most instructors will be asked to stick around until 3.30. So we'll have an additional um, 
period where we can have some group discussion and additional Q&A. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Juliet, who will introduce uh, Dr. Boyson. Excellent. Thank you, Elliot. Hello, everyone. Um, Natalie, you can go ahead and start pulling up your, your presentation. So I'm happy to be with you today. I'm Juliet Homer from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, or PNNL. And our first speaker today is Natalie Voisin. Uh, she's a chief scientist for regional water energy dynamics in the Earth Systems Predictability and Resilience Group at PNNL. Her research focuses on advancements in hydrometeorology forecasting and coupling of human Earth system models to unlock new understandings around critical energy and water systems. She holds a dual appointment as associate professor at University of Washington in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and has been associated associate editor for the Water Resources Research uh, since 2017. And she is a co-author of the fifth National Climate Assessment Energy Chapter. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, interregional impact of resource availability. I'm going to talk about hydro. And I'm also going to talk about uh, wind and solar IDA as they work together. And of course, um, this is something that I work on. I work on it with a team. And so it's going to reflect really the state of the art at this time on how to develop, um, how to understand uh, how climate is impacting your region, but also the region around you uh, to develop more robust long-term planning. Talking about long-term planning, oops. Talking about long-term planning, uh, um, the regional planning across the continental US is done across a number of regions. Uh, it's being done at the state, at the scale of the entire interconnect, so Western, Eastern, and ERCOT. It's also being done at a number of other scales, including as the independent system operator and uh, the non um, the non ISO regions as well. Those are also at the balancing authority and then down to the utilities. Uh, every time you go at different scale, you may have different questions on your resilience to climate. Uh, what is being done is that when you are at utility or balancing authority, what ha was happening in the past is that you're looking at one of the extreme events. Um, until until uh, recently, uh, all of the conditions around your regions, uh, there is not necessarily a lot of knowledge sharing, and there is a lot of assumptions that we are being held uh, stationary based on the last couple, uh, last couple previous years. Um, so just here to mention that the scenarios support reliability studies and evaluate the new generation portfolio. But this is changing. Uh, what we are seeing uh, presently over the entire portfolio is that we have an increased reliance on renewables, specifically wind and solar across different projections. What you see here on the left is uh, for the entire US, those are the new addition over the last couple of years. And those addition are mostly wind and solar. So really an increase on the reliance of climate overall. And this reliance is going to increase. So what you see on the right are projection of uh, the annual electricity generation specifically here for the Western US. And there's a lot of uncertainty here. We're looking here at two different types of policy current policy with IRA, and then uh, 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 scenarios where uh, we also have uh, the goals of uh, complete net zero transition. Um, same thing here, you see that the portfolio is really highly dependent on wind and solar, and the light blue that you see is hydro. Those are uh, renewable resources uh, that all have a sensitivity or they're all based on climate. The climate is providing the natural resources. Um, so those technology you can see here on the on the lower uh, side of the slides. For thermoelectric plants with cooling, uh, they're dependent on the climate, uh, on the fuel, when they are based on biomass. Uh, so it's water availability. And they're also dependent, uh, depending on the cooling uh, technology, they're also going to be dependent on the temperature and relative humidity. And, uh, and water availability and quality, the temperature. Uh, for hydropower, uh, very sensitive to natural resources as well. Uh, the fuel is the water, similarly for solar and for wind. So those 
those resources are driven, the fuel is provided uh, by a hydro climate. That means that with an increased reliance on a renewable, we see more and more concerns about what if those resources are not there. It means that we need an understanding of droughts and floods, and that's what we're going to address here. Uh, so to, pro to discuss a little bit some of the scale, when we talk about hydrological droughts, uh, typically those droughts are going to be at the scale of months to years, and I'm saying years, they can go from just one year, but they can last multiple years. And for uh, energy droughts, here I'm energy droughts is actually electricity droughts, uh, really focusing on wind and solar compounded. And the scale that we are looking at typically are hours to days, but also to season. So how do we use that? You know, it's very qualitative here. Those are generalities. How do you put this into your long-term planning? And what is the current state of the art? So as you know, uh, let's start first with wind and solar. The wind and solar uh, variation propagates onto other technologies at this time. We're looking here at uh, the duct curve. This is net load. So this is electricity demand minus the wind and solar. And what you're seeing is that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the, the wind and solar actually, and specifically solar, exceed the electricity demand. So this is why you have your net load and basically a zero net load uh, during the, the peak uh, midday. And what that means is that between 4 to 8 p.m. when the, the sun sets, you need a ramping technologies to compensate and balance the load. So this is why I was saying that diurnal cycle is normal, very highly predictable, and uh, it really transforms ramping needs uh, of, of the power grid and propagates onto the grid. For wind, it's the same, except that this is not necessarily just diurnal cycle. And here we're looking at this, at the case of uh, in BPA, where we are looking at too much wind. Uh, we have um, over the Northwest, we have a lot of resources, especially on the water and, uh, and wind. We're looking here at a couple of cases where the water is addressing the firm, uh, the firm electricity uh, generation, and it's addressing the load. And during certain uh, days or uh, certain hours of the day, we actually see that there was too much wind confounded with water and the wind needed to, cut, to be curtailed. So same story with wind. It just means that uh, wind variation, they also propagate onto the grid, onto the water and other technologies. And with the uptake of wind and solar in regional generation portfolio, we're looking not only at too much, uh, it's too much, it's not great, too little is not great either. So we really need to look at both, but we're going to check just specifically droughts here. Um, how do you integrate those energy droughts into the long-term planning? The question was first, well, how do you define those energy droughts? And uh, we have on the climate side, we have a lot of different scale, but none of those scales, I'm going to talk about synoptic scale, meso scale, um, they're not necessarily relevant to power systems. Uh, what we found was perhaps relevant to power systems is the balancing authority. The reason being that at that scale, wind and solar resources are must pay, and they're not dispatchable without storage. So all of the wind and solar within that scale uh, is going to be a shortfall um, if that needs to be uh, addressed by either storage or transmission. Uh, so that provides kind of a good scale to make sure that we have a relevant definition of an energy drought for long-term planning of system operators. So we, uh, what we see in this graph is that now that we have introduced all of the balancing authorities as one of the other of very convenient scale that matters for long-term planning, especially with energy droughts. We're looking here at uh, 40 years of hourly wind and solar and load data that uh, were recently developed and for, for each of the balancing, uh, balancing authority. So you have the average that is in the bold 
And then you have all of the ensemble that is a bit gray out in the background. Uh, something to look at is first the blue and the orange line. Those are uh, the solar and wind. What you're going to see here is that uh, we're looking here at seasonal patterns. And you're going to see here that uh, the wind and solar, those two resources, they actually uh, complement each other naturally. For example, you can see uh, where you have, we have here a, a red, um, the red square over, uh, over uh, Montana in the Northwest. We see that during the summer, you have more solar and less wind. And come to winter, you have less wind and more solar. And we have the same in Pacific Core, uh, uh, Pacific Core East, where uh, you also get uh, much less, uh, much less wind in the summer. And you have a similar patterns, more or less, across each of the balancing authority. What it means here it has application to long-term storage. How much do you need? It's very important that if you're looking at long-term storage, you evaluate. The, uh, the resources on both solar and wind together. And uh, then it's a matter of load. Uh, it's important to note, you know, when it, when you have those energy droughts, are there going to be, uh, what is going to be the largest drivers during peak demand? Uh, when you have a winter peaking or a summer peaking, uh, is the driver going to be more on wind or more on solar? Uh, those concepts are going to be helping each of the balancing authority select what are the critical energy droughts? And that's a function of load, of course. It means that here we're looking at peak load, but it also means that you can actually have an energy drought during low, uh, low load season. That's something that look, to look forward in the future. So those data sets are available. Um, that was at the seasonal scale, understanding how we manage hydro, uh, hydropower, uh, hydrogen, and lo other long-term storage. The other piece that we keep um, looking at is a uh, sh shorter term energy droughts. Um, so here we're still looking at compound, wind, and solar. We've been using the same time series. We're presenting on those two maps short term energy droughts. So what you see on the left is for each of the balancing authority, we've been looking at the, the worst hour in that 40 years. The, the, first, the worst 10% of hours with the lowest compound wind and solar. And we're looking at how many consecutive of uh, those hours you have. And then we count how, how, how often it happens. So to read this map on the left here, uh, the example for, would be for California. Uh, you can expect that there are about 10 compound droughts a year on average that last to up to 18 hours, where during those 18 hours, you have the worst energy droughts at an hourly time scale. The impact here, and they last up, they typically last a bit less than a day. Where it's important is how uh, the ability of storage to recharge or not. So here it means that really storing, uh, managing storage has to be over uh, 18 hours or you rely on transmission. We also look at um, droughts that are perhaps a little bit longer. And this is going to be what you have on the right. We're talking about daily droughts. Daily droughts is where um, those are the worst days over the entire day. So you may have some of your storage during that time, but it's still going to be limited because now you have to manage your storage over multiple days. And this is what you see on, on the graph here. Again, taking California as an example, yes, uh, over this balancing authority, you can expand as of today, you have about four compound droughts a year on average that last up to six days. We do know that California is relying a lot of, of import, uh, on imports. Uh, so this is how those droughts are being managed today. In places like Texas, where you have less uh, import opportunities, then it's a bit more complex to address. Uh, they have different techniques to addressing those uh, those energy droughts. Um, so what we're looking here is the frequency of droughts. Um, we see that the uh, they decrease with longer uh, the frequency decreases with longer time scale, and we see that California has the shortest hourly compound drought, but they are very intense, but they have the longest daily droughts. Um, 
this is not going to be a short form unless uh, the load, if the, the electricity demand is not there, if the wind and solar are not there, that's all right. So what we're looking at here is that for all of our different droughts over current infrastructure, we're looking at uh, in green, uh, this is uh, for every time you have a drought, what is the fraction of the load? And uh, so then the variation is for each of the balancing authority. And so what we're doing is that for a one hour drought, typically, so the worst drought, uh, we're seeing that typically it's about uh, between one and 5% of the load during that time. This is going to increase in the future as the generation portfolio relies more on wind and solar, but that provides us a perspective and a concept. What we're seeing in blue is uh, when we, uh, we do this analytics, but specifically for high load. Uh, so when you have a peak load, uh, what is the, the fraction of, uh, of loss? It's the shortfall of, um, the, shortfall of the, the supply. And we're seeing that this, uh, this is actually uh, in, increased. We actually see that on, uh, in general, wind and solar droughts happened during peak load uh, more, than, more than not. And when it does, then uh, we're seeing a shortfall of, a, it's not shortfall, but it's uh, between five, uh, up to five and 8% uh, uh, over three days and five days. We're seeing that this fraction actually increases as the, the, the length increase. So why it's important? Again, I mentioned storage. Storage is going to be critical for, uh, uh, for reliability and resource adequacy. And what we're seeing as of today is that uh, what you have here on the right is the different use of storage over the US as of today. And we're seeing that for time scales that are below two hours, uh, the storage is being used for grid services only, specifically grid stability, not being reserved. So not necessarily energy shortfall, really just the stability. Uh, when we look at uh, four to eight hours, we are looking at uh, use for load shifting, storage and management, charge and recharge. We're not seeing more a lot of uh, a lot of use of storage beyond eight hours. Uh, and 60% of the new battery storage installation is intended to be hybridized with wind and solar plants. But what we did today here was actually showing the scale of the energy drought when storage is important. Uh, there is the day-to-day -day use, but there is the needed in terms of resilience. So what we've been showing here so far on this graph, you're showing all of the time scale of the energy droughts, wind and solar compound, wind and solar that we evaluated. Each of the colors is for the different balancing authority. We have the number of droughts per year. As expected, the shorter droughts are very much, much, much more frequent. The longer they are, they are less frequent. However, we saw that they were also more intense. They need, they need more storage. And uh, what we're seeing also on this graph is two things. First, there is a lot of differences between each of the balancing authority. So when we're looking at reliability studies, we're going to look at a lot of customization for each different balancing authority. It's very difficult to generalize. The other thing that we're looking at is that we saw that the storage is being managed mostly for time scales that are below 12 hours. And the market incentives as well are for uh, below 12 hours. So we're seeing here at both a technological gap where from a dispatch perspective, uh, there isn't much that is being, uh, we need more. We need, to, uh, we need to really fill this gap, technological gap to use climate intelligence, to use our storage uh, more appropriately so that we don't overbuild storage. And we actually use storage uh, uh, more smartly. Uh, the other part is going to be the market incentives. There are some resources that at this time have an obligation to use, I'm thinking about hydro, uh, that have an obligation to maintain capacity and they're managing this capacity and that storage over multiple days. But this is not necessarily the case for lithium battery storage that is hybridized with wind and solar. And so there is a kind of a miss. Um, a missed opportunities here, but making sure that if we want to really uh, manage for, for reliability moving forward, we really need to also have the market incentive for all storage 
around the scale of energy drought. Um, I mentioned that I would do water, and I want to address water here as well, where that water is really doing that longer term storage. Um, what we have over this, the, those maps here on the left, those are the hydropower plants as of today over, uh, over the US. And something to note about uh, those location is that if you start in the Northeast, a drought is typically one year long and uh, the interannual variability is actually pretty low. When we talk about a drought, it's a drought, but there's a small variation in the changes in water availability. The more you go around the diagonal to the desert southwest to southeast, your interannual variability in water is spiking. And uh, you have you can have no water for two years in a row. It is being largely alleviated by the storage capacity. The storage is being managed over multiple years in the desert, desert southwest. The reason I'm spending time here is to, uh, to understand what the impact of droughts on the power grid, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this. It's going to be very important that um, to understand the interannual variability and that storage is being managed over multiple years already, alleviating those droughts. Um, we also have the thermoelectric plants. I also um, introduced them earlier. Um, they, based on the cooling system, they're going to rely on the water availability. We see much, much more thermoelectric on uh, the Eastern Interconnect because there's a lot of water. The concern then there is going to be more water quality than quantity. So it's the stream temperature. Um, so what does that bring us with, with droughts here? So because of larger interannual variability, I'm really going to focus on the Western US on this one. Um, those are droughts. Um, what you're seeing here are illustration of what a drought looked like, it's spatially distributed. We have here 20 years of, uh, this is soil moisture, so water availability spatially distributed. And something to note here is that uh, you see a lot of, uh, it's, it's regional. There is not a single, image that look the same. Uh, let me ex uh, explain perhaps a bit more the figure. When it's white, it means that it's a wet year. It's not in a drought. When it's yellow and and uh, kind of beige, uh, this is kind of a abnormal, moderate drought. Nothing that a water management cannot address. So from a hydropower perspective, that's not a drought. Uh, when we start going into the red and the brown, then you start seeing something that you, uh, is going to start impacting water management and necessary, eventually ability to meet all of the water demands and all the water use. So when you focus on that red and that deep red, you see that the drought is not everywhere. It's not every year, except what we had in California between 2014 and 2015. That was pretty drastic because those were the same location for two to three years in a row. So the impact here is that uh, how does the, um, the drought impact uh, the, the Western US? It's not everywhere. And we have the regional variability on our side to alleviate the impact of drought on hydropower and then future on the grid. And here's how. Um, now that you've seen this map and you're starting being, uh, that you're familiar with the geography, uh, we're looking here at the map of the Western US where all of the blue are the power plants. Uh, they are mostly in the Northwest. What we've seen that, what we see in the desert Southwest is much more thermoelectric plants that depend on water. There's less hydro, more thermoelectric plants. So you have a dipole with changes in technology. Uh, what we're seeing as well is this is where um, having a friend with climate dynamics in their skill set is important is uh, understanding that uh, typically when it's wet somewhere, it's dry somewhere else and vice versa. And we can predict those. Uh, we're looking here at um, the, for example, the El Nino Southern uh, oscillations. We had one in the uh, Northwest this year. During an El Nino event, typically it's going to be drier and warmer in, uh, in the Northwest, and it's going to be wetter in California. It means that when there is a drought, uh, so there will be a drought in the Northwest, but there will be a bit more water 
uh, in, uh, in California. So what you see on the right is the reflection of what a drought can do or what this regional variability does um, across at the scale of the interconnect. We're looking at uh, energy prices during an El Nino. We're seeing that there is uh, an increase in the production cost with respect to an average year. That's because there is a drought somewhere. During a La Nina year, there's also an increase in cost because during a La Nina year, there's going to be a drought somewhere else. And then there are all of the other years. What's interesting to see is that during all of the other years, it goes all over the place. It means that some places, maybe it's wet everywhere, maybe it's dry everywhere. Uh, so this is actually uh, some of the things we hear in the media. Oh, it's a Nino, it's going to be a tough year on the grid. Actually not. Because we have that regional variability, uh, it's actually uh, more problematic when we don't have a very strong uh, a very strong variability uh, in the region. Um, this is a little graph to further explain what's happening here between the region and the impact on the future climate. We're looking here at the Northwest. This is where you have the hydropower resources. In the desert Southwest, this is where you have the thermoelectric resources. And where is this generation going? Actually, a lot is going to Southern California. So if, you, if we keep with this example, with the impact of climate change on water availability, um, it's impacting California in the Northwest. If there is a drought in the Northwest, it's like a switch. If the, if the, the electrons can come from the water in the Northwest, it's going to come from the thermoelectric in the desert Southwest. And what it means, it also means that when the impact of climate change is impacting the Northwest specifically, uh, the snowpack storage of water, it means that it impacts the entire grid just because of that switch concept. So those regional dependencies are extremely strong. And this is one of those examples where when you do the long-term planning in one region, like Southern California, you really need to understand what's happening in uh, the desert Southwest and in the Northwest and how each of them are adapting and if you can really still have the same assumptions on what the import and exports are going to be. And that will be the same if you're in the desert Southwest, you need to know what's happening in other regions because of those types of dynamics. What can we do to help to get and understand those dynamics? So there is more being made available to the planners at this time. Here we're looking at, um, so balancing authority is really our scale at this time because of wind and solar. And also here, we're looking at the projections of hydropower. So we're looking at a, an un, upcoming assessment that is being done at, uh, at all of, for the entire hydropower state for the continental US, and uh, but aggregated balancing authority. And we are looking at, for each individual balancing authority, if you're trying to understand what's going to happen over your regions, you can use this assessment to say, what's, you know, what's the range we have? Uh, the highest range, and we're seeing an increase about everywhere, uh, but you can look at some of the numbers, and you might want to say, what's the lowest range? What's the, you know, if it's going to be dry, by how dry it's going to be? So this will be the diagram on the left here, where we do see in places like California, where you have a huge range of uncertainty, you actually see some substantial decrease in, 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 the, um, in the potential hydropower. This being said, as a reminder, for each balancing authority and utilities, you can use this upper row, but if you want to do the planning and understanding the regional coordination, you need to select events that are going to be realistic. You're not going to have the low hydro everywhere during the once, once a year. As an illustration, this is the second row there, where you're seeing the changes in hydropower generation during the first the two worst droughts for each of the interconnect, the Eastern and the Western interconnect. Something to see, the, those two worst droughts, they don't look the same, right? And so it, here, this is also kind of a, uh, a key message is that it's going to be very difficult to do resource adequacy. And it's already great to make sure that we have a realistic what a drought look like, but it's going to be very important that you select a couple of them. Question will be how you select them. So this is the type of visualization that we are developing here. 
uh, we have the different hydropower regions over the Western US, and we are looking at for the past uh, 20 years, uh, how hydropower uh, was affected by each of those regions. So that's a way to rank the hydropower, uh, the hydropower, the water droughts, hydropower droughts uh, by uh, by severity. And uh, 1977 uh, is still the drought of record that is being used in a lot of uh, resource adequacy. And the, the size of the, the dots here is because for the Colombia, this is where you have all of the major resources. So if you look at the entire scale, typically they're going to be, it's going to be the regions that drive what will be the worst drought. If you want to have a bit more diversity, you can look here at the different regions and then do a different combinations. Um, but those type of, uh, of settings is what allow us to work with planners on selecting uh, the drought and also making sure that either you use the data sets directly or sometimes we've seen planners that prefer having their data sets and then scale them. So this is uh, something that is perfect to make sure that you don't say, oh, it's a drought, we're going to have 30% less hydropower everywhere at the same time. This is the type of uh, new information that really helps with the implementation uh, across a uh, different way. We, we are, we're flexible. It's important to just move forward together. So with this, I'd like to have the, the takeaways on, I went through a lot of concepts, but the things to remember is that with the increased reliance on renewable energy, we do need to consider energy droughts in regional planning. There are multiple scales where you're going to integrate it differently. You can do it if you are at the interconnect scale, the entire way that is done interconnect. The regional variability in available resources typically alleviate the droughts. So it's important that the resource adequacy and the reliability studies need to consider multiple energy droughts. So that you know, I showed two, and then I showed how many droughts we could we could have. Select a number of them, not just one, because they really all look different. And it's important to have compound energy droughts. That, so it means you need to use coincidence when solar, load, and hydro together. And you can do it over a week, but you can also do it over an entire season and a couple of uh, multi-year to get multiple multi-year droughts. If you're at the utility or balancing authority scale, the worst compound energy drought might be selected for informing planning. So you, you go for what I was showing here with the map, go with your five percentile, the worst drought you can have in your region. But you might wonder, how do I, am I going to set the boundary conditions based on your modeling tools? Um, so here, this is where it's good to, to work, to talk with, a, to have a working group. Uh, it's going to be important to have an ensemble of regional opportunities and constraints that need to be considered, uh, leveraging uh, established regional dynamics like the dipoles that I was talking about, or uh, the ranking of the drought that we talked about so that you can set up the, the realistic boundary conditions and you can have the right expectation of import and export from the different regions. Um, what can we do to help? At uh, this time, you were getting, uh, you're going to find more and more catalog of extreme events with the associated impacts on load and generation resources on future and uh, on future infrastructure. And we are sharing them with system operators in two formats, actually three, the data sets directly, or you saw a ways to scale up and down and, and the expertise. Uh, more efforts though is still needed for the implementation of the scenarios and selections of the extremes that are going to help you. Um, we also want to mention that efforts are still needed to explore dispatch opportunities across regions. Really need to understand how those resources uh, want to curtail, want to not curtail. Also, it's not just generation, it's also reserve and the number of service. As we mentioned, we also need to understand market opportunities because your power system models are going to use storage in a way that is not compatible with uh, the extreme events that we are putting into the model. So those are things that um, we think uh, where the research is moving forward. But it means that there's already a lot to go and move forward on getting an regional dependency in your long-term planning. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hey, uh, Nathalie, thank, thank you so much. That was uh, just such a comprehensive and, and uh, useful uh, amount of information there. Really appreciate it. I 
think we're at time, but I'll I'll try and slip in one question here. Um, you know, thinking about uh, our our audience and and regulators in general. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, energy droughts and the types of models that you use um, to identify you know potential future energy issues um, related to wind and solar. And um, is there any ideas or, or suggestions? Um, or do you think the utilities or or even commissions might be able to use some of these models um, as they're looking ahead and at resource adequacy? Well, that's thanks for asking. Actually, this is where I'm excited to present today. It's exactly to engage even more on those on those angles. Uh, some of the the energy drought research that was done here, those catalogs, they are being done with today infrastructure, which is already have a very um, you know, a lot of the, the good wind and solar spots have been taken and you have a very nice distribution. It means that when we're looking at the future energy droughts, we're actually seeing that uh, it's not because um, we have a change in infrastructure, they're not getting necessarily more frequent, but they are getting more intense because we're getting more and more, more wind and solar uh, in the portfolio. And so, those data sets are available. Um, it's flexible enough that if you want to test new infrastructure, this can be developed as well for your uh, for your evaluation. But it can be a bit nerdy to go directly and, and you know, who is doing all of their Python scripts today. Uh, so those are something that you can also uh, talk with us on really the the, uh, the scale. Like if you have very specification, do you think that this type of drought, so what is the 10% chance that this, this type of drought is going to happen? Will there be those uh, regional dependency? Can we can we rely on these regions or not? This is the part of the questions that uh, saying not everything is in the data set. It's also in the sharing of the expertise. So Perfect. please reach out. Yeah, thank, thank you again. Um, really appreciate it. And I think we'll move ahead now to uh, regional planning considerations for grid forming inverter models. We have uh, Dr. Wu. Um, Juliet, will, will you go ahead and introduce Dr. Wu? Yeah, sure. We're pleased to have uh, Wei Du with us today. And Wei Du is also from PNNL. And Wei, if you want to go ahead and start pulling up your slides while you do your intro. Uh, sure. So Wei Du is a staff research engineer at PNNL. And his main areas of research are control design, modeling, and simulation of power systems with high penetration of power electronic devices. He currently serves as the principal investigator for many DOE projects that focus on studying the impacts of high penetration of inverter-based resources on the transient and dynamic behavior of the power system at different scales. He's the technical lead of the modeling and simulation area of the Universal Interoperability for Grid Forming Inverters Consortium. And he is the lead contributor for the first WEC approved grid forming inverter model. Wei, thank you so much for being with us. You can take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So, and also very happy to introduce our work to this group. Uh, so can you see my screen now? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. So. Hello everyone. So today my presentation is about the role of grid forming inverters in high renewable power grid. So I'm not sure how many how many of you have heard about this term grid forming, but this is a really uh, popular and important concept uh, in the inverter based world. And many people are discussing it uh, in industry like NERC and the many utilities. <clears throat> so I will talk some uh, work about this area. So here is the uh, outline. Uh, so firstly, I will talk about the grid forming and the grid following uh, inverter concept. So what that's, what's those grid forming and what, what grid following means? And then I will talk about this first uh, WAC approved grid forming inverter model and introduce some use cases uh, using this model. And then finally, I will talk about the, the real world demonstration project of a grid forming inverter at the 380 megawatt wind and solar and battery a combined power pl power plant. So actually, this is the first uh, site in the U.S. to combine wind, solar, and energy storage together. It's called a wet ridge power plant. So I will talk about some details later. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about what what's this grid forming and grid following means. So uh, so to explain it in a in a simple way, 
I would say that uh, many of, of you might know that today's power grids are dominated by synchronous machines. We have a lot of synchronous machines, hydro gener generation units, coal power plants, uh, gas turbines in the power grid. So the, the power grid is mainly dominated by the synchronous machines. We also have renewables in the grid like solar, wind, PV, but they're uh, at the interconnection wide systems, their penetration level is not that high compared to uh, synchronous machines. So in this way, today's inverter-based resources like wind, solar, and energy storage, they are designed to uh, follow the synchronous machines. We call it grid following because in this design philosophy, the machines uh, the machines dominate the power grid, so they maintain the stability of the grid. And the renewables, they just follow the grid. They don't need to care about the voltage and the frequency regulation. They just follow the synchronous machines and uh, uh, provide the injected you know, uh, P and Q, active and reactive power to the grid. <laughs> However, this design architecture is not well suited for the future power grids with very high penetration of renewables. Because in the future, we know that uh, as more and more synchronous machine-based resources uh, retire, like coal plants re retire, we will have less and less synchronous machines in the system. Meanwhile, we expect to see a lot of renewables, wind, solar, and energy storage, those inverter-based resources in power system. So that means this, this kind of design architecture, the grid uh, synchronous machines dominate the grid and inverters follow the grid, it will not work for the future power grids with high penetration of renewables because you have less and less synchronous machines and they are not enough, strong enough to dominate this grid. So you, you should not expect those synchronous machines to dominate the grid and inverters just still follow the grid. So that will, that will really, really not work in the future power grids with high penetration of renewables. That will cause stability issues. So in that way, we need to think about how we can redesign the inverter-based resources to make them actively form the grid and dominate the grid. So in the future, we have less synchronous machines, but we have, we have high penetration of renewables and the batteries. So it's time for them to dominate the grid. So they need to form the grid. So that's what means uh, where the grid forming concept Came, came, uh, comes up because we need in the future, if, if we have high penetration of renewables, rain, they need to actively control the grid and regulate your voltage and the frequency on their own. So this is why what I mean, what we mean by grid forming. So to achieve that, we need to change the firmware, the control strategy of inverters, because today I would say 99.9% inverters are grid following. But if we continue to go towards that direction, we will see the stability issues in the power grid. So we need to change the fundamental control of the inverters to from grid falling to grid forming so that they can actively control the dominate the grid and regulate the voltage and the frequency. So I hope this uh, kind of explanation can give a, a uh, intuitive understanding of these basic concepts. But this is just a brief introduction and in the later slides, I will exp explain a bit more so you can see what the benefits of this grid forming technology can bring to future power grids with very high penetration of renewables. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so PNL has been uh, working on this grid forming inverter for uh, quite a few years, actually my many years. But I think the problem is that how we can help utility industry understand why grid forming inverters are important to them because uh, they, they don't know, do know too much about this technology. So a few years ago, when we talked to the WEC planning engineers, you know, West Interconnection planning engineers, they told me, oh, they are very interested in this new technology, but they, they don't know too many details about that. And in, in the WEC uh, model library, there is no grid forming inverter model there. So for the transmission planners and operators, they cannot do simulation studies to evaluate how this grid forming technology can impact their grid. So we told them, okay, we are, we are very familiar with this technology. We can help you to develop models and you can use the model to run the simulation studies to see how this technology will be beneficial for your grid as the penetration of inverters continues to increase in the grid. So, uh, uh, so has, it took about two or three years. In the past two or three years, we are working with the WEC uh, engineers on developing this model. Uh, the 
So uh, most recently, and the, that, that model recently become a WAC approved grid forming inverter model. So basically, uh, PNL led the work on developing the first uh, droop based uh, grid forming inverter model. And this model was, as mentioned, was recently uh, approved by WAC. And this model has also has been included in the, all the uh, commercial simulation tools used by today's power system planning engineers. Uh, if you are familiar with the transmission planning studies, you, you know, engineers use uh, power system simulation tools like PSSE, PSRF, Power War Simulator, and the TSAT. So uh, in the past few years, we work with uh, WAC engineers and also self software vendors we get, get this model development, developed and implemented all the commercial simulation tools. So that means with these models, uh, including the model libraries of all, all those commercial, uh, commercial simulation tools, the transmission planning engineers can start to use them and to evaluate how this uh, grid forming technology. So uh, Western Interconnection WEC is very proud of this uh, work. They call it the first generation uh, grid forming inversion model. So. You may know that for today's, you no, know, we uh, the WAC model library already have the grid falling inverter models for more than 15 years, but this is the first grid forming inverter model. So that's, uh, I think that's a pretty important uh, thing for transmission planning engineers to use this model so they can evaluate how this uh, technology can impact their grid. And also uh, this work also draw uh, DOE Secretary of Energy, uh, Jennifer Granholm's attention. So she uh, quoted this work on Twitter. So uh, this slide uh, shows the details of this model. So uh, I guess because the presentation is mainly for regulators, I don't want to talk too many details about those control blocks, but I'll just let you know that this is the first WEC approved grid forming inverter model. And also it is included in the, all the commercial simulation tools. So the transmission planning engineers and operators can access them and to use this model to uh, evaluate how this grid forming technology can impact their power grid. So and I'm, I'm not going to talk about all the details of these control blocks. I think this is not useful for you, but I would rather to talk about uh, uh, the industry engagement and the use case study, because I think the model, the model itself is a very fundamental work, but the key thing is that how the transmission planners and operators can use this model to evaluate how this technology can bring benefits to their power grid. So I will mainly talk about the industry uh, engagement and the uh, use case study. So as I think in the, once the model has been developed in the past several years, we are collaborating with a lot of uh, utilities, ISOs, uh, you know, uh, different organizations to, to get them, help them get familiar with this uh, work. You can see in the right table, we are working with NERC, WAC, ERCOT, and a lot of utilities uh, to help them get familiar with this technology. And also we have several inverter manufacturers that are also supporting us on developing these models like uh, General Electric, uh, SMA, uh, Siemens. These, these manufacturers are also helping us on developing these models. So in these slides, I just show some uh, examples of, of how we collaborate with different uh, organizations uh, to, to evaluate this technology. So the first thing is that the WAC recently published a report on grid forming inverters. Basically, uh, they used the model developed by PNL to study how this uh, grid forming technology, when they are being applied to wind, solar, and energy storage, how they can be used to improve the system uh, frequency stability. So uh, this report was just published in uh, October, I believe. So it shows some details about how this new technology can improve the system frequency stability. And also we're uh, collaborating with ERCOT. ERCOT is also very uh, interesting in this technology uh, because in their power grid, they also have very high penetration of renewables, especially wind. And in some regions in their power grid, the system is very weak. And historically, they identify some uh, stability issues. In some weak power grids, if they have high penetration of solar, uh, a battery, a battery and wind, if they use a traditional grid falling technologies in their transmission planning studies, they will, they will see some stability issues. But when they start to use our grid forming inversion model, when they replace any storage uh, with grid forming any storage, and then they, they saw that they solved that stability issue. It's very promising uh, results. 
And also we're also collaborating with some islands like Puerto Rico because they're rebuilding their power grid. The grid forming technologies is also very important to them. So we are collaborating with them to see how these grid forming inverters uh, can be beneficial for their power grid stability. We have a paper uh, published to, uh, recently. So I'm not going to talk about all those use cases. I just want to give some in, uh, simple uh, example to tell how this, uh, this technology can be beneficial for uh, planning studies to consider this technology. Uh, here is just one simple example to show why this technology can be beneficial to the power grid. So we can see that uh, this, this is a simulation results done by WEC transmission planning engineers using our model. So what they are doing is that uh, in their WEC system base case, uh, they replaced many of grid falling inverters with grid forming inverters. And they assume these inverters have some headroom, maybe 10% headroom for wind, solar, and you know, battery storage. We, we assume they have, they have some headroom. And then they did a contingency analysis. They tripped the largest generator in their Western connect, connection is polyvalent units. So they trip these polyvalent un generation units that will cause a major system frequency event. And they want to see how different units can respond to these events to improve the system frequency stability. You know, because when we lost of a generator in the system, we have power unbalance. The other resources have to respond very quickly to mitigate this generation loss, right? To compensate for this generation loss. And this figure just shows that how different generation units respond to this loss of generation event. You know, ideally, the faster they, they can respond to this event, the better is good for the system frequency stability, right? So here, the slide uh, shows that the response of grid forming inverter, the hydro turbine, the gas turbine, and the traditional uh, grid falling inverter. You can see that you know, if today is still synchronous machine dominant system, you can see the hydro and the gas response to the uh, uh, the loss of generation unit in the system relatively very quickly, you know, when the generator was tripped, uh, both hydro and gas turbine response very quickly, quickly at the very beginning. However, for the gas turbine and the hydro units, their mechanical governor response kind of slow. So even though they respond very quickly at the very beginning, but because, they have, because of their slow response of their mechanical governor, you can see the power goes down a little bit and then slowly it's go up. This is just because their mechanical governor response slow. And then for this green, green line is today's grid falling technology. You can see that their response is much slower compared to hydro and the gas turbine. You can see when the generator was tripped, these grid falling inverters increase their power very slowly. So that's why what I mean by in the future, if we have more and more grid falling inverter and less synchronous machine in the system, they will cause problem to the system stability because when the generator will, is tripped, there will, a huge, there will be a huge power imbalance. But if your grid falling inverter response this kind of slow, that's really not good for your stability. So finally, let's take a look at this grid forming technology is a blue line. You can see that a grid forming technology is very similar to synchronous machine. So at the very beginning when the generator is tripped, this grid forming inverter responds to this event almost instantaneously, very similar to synchronous machine, right? It responds very quickly. But the difference between the grid forming inverter and the synchronous machine that it does not, does not have the constraints of the uh, slow response of the me mechanical governor because all of them are electric power. So the grid forming inverter responds even faster than synchronous machine in this time frame. You can see the synchronous machine has to respond slowly because of their slow response of governor, but the grid forming inverters, as long as they have sufficient headroom, they can respond much faster than synchronous machine. So this is a, a, a significant advantage of grid forming technology for the stability of, of power grid. So as we have more and more uh, inverter, grid forming inverter in a system, I think this is really good for the uh, st uh, system stability. So in the long-term planning studies, you don't need to worry too much about the stability. So uh, this figure just shows the advantage of this technology. And this is just a simple, uh, single resource, their response to a system, just, just show how a single model can respond to this uh, disturbance. So now I'm going to, uh, going to a more uh, complicated use case. Uh, to introduce how this technology can be beneficial uh, to the future power grids. So we know 
we all know that there will be more and more inverter-based resources, renewables, energy storage connected to the system. And they will be connected both at the transmission level and the distribution level. So at the transmission level, we, can, we, can, we are expecting 100 megawatts of power plants uh, to connect to the power grid, solar, wind, battery. And at the distribution level, we are expecting a lot of residential behind the meter, small DERs connect to the, the distribution level. Right, so their single units, their capacity is very small, maybe just 10 kilowatt or below one megawatt, but there will be many, many of these DERs in the distribution system. So their road to the stability is also very important as the penetration becomes high and higher and higher. And at PNL, we have developed some uh, open source tools to uh, do, do the integrated transmission and distribution system co-simulation to study in the future, you know, if we have integrated transmission and distribution system co-simulation, if we have so many inverters at both transmission and distribution levels, uh, how, the, how these inverters uh, can improve or uh, impact the stability of the power grid. So here, the use case, what we did here is that at the left side is a mini wax system. It's a transmission system. Uh, it's a mini wax system, but it has 19 load buses. And each load bus actually represents the distribution level load. But here we want to do a detailed transmission distribution system co-simulation. So at the right side, we have another open source tool. We are able to model the details of the distribution system with uh, high penetration of, you know, of inverters. For example, for this IE 8500 node test feeder, we can add 500 inverters in this feeder to represent those residential behind the meter inverters. And then for each 19 load bus at the left side, for each bus, load bus, we replace this load bus with a detailed distribution feeder model with 500 inverters. So by doing so, actually we created an integrated transmission and distribution system with more than 10,000 inverters at both at the transmission and distribution levels. So in this case, we want to see, oh, if we have this grid forming or inverters, maybe either grid forming or grid falling, how they can in impact this, this, the stability of this integrated system. And with this simulation platform developed, uh, we are going to look at, uh, we are trying to answer two questions. Okay, so uh, the, the question, the first question is, okay, today's power grids are still dominated by synchronous machines and the inverters use these today's grid falling technologies. Okay, so, and then if we continue using grid falling inverters and at what penetration level they will cause problems or will they not cause problems? We don't know. We can still use today's grid falling inverters, but as the penetration level becomes higher and higher, we want to see what, what happens in the power grid. So we did a penetration level studies, but with the inverters still using today's grid falling technology. And you can see that uh, this is a still a system frequency response. You know, we trip the power level units, generations in the system to study system frequency, frequency stability. You can see the 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 black dashed line is the base case. You no, know, we, we have zero penetration of inverters. It's all simple the machine. And you can see this is a very typical uh, frequency response of the machine dominated system. However, as, as, as we add more and more grid falling inverters in the system, we will see that you know, for the same event, if you have more and more grid falling inverters in the system, the frequency stability, the frequency nadir point, nadir point keeps dropping. That means the system frequency becomes worse. And then eventually, if we go to penetration level to the uh, around 80% for this uh, 10,000 inverter system, we see that uh, it's not just the frequency nadir point issue. The system becomes unstable because we, during the simulation, we observe some 35 hertz oscillation in the system. So that means at this penetration level with grid falling inverters, they are not able to maintain the stability of the system. That will cause problems. So at least for this simulation study, it shows that you know, if we continue to use grid falling inverters, as, as the penetration becomes higher and higher, we see the frequency stability issues because the frequency in data points keeps dropping. And at a certain level, the system cannot maintain its stability. So it, it will, will uh, decrease the stability of the system. And then we are going to address, uh, to look at the second question. You know, if we think grid forming inverters are important, so how many of them are needed in the future power grid? And how many of them are able to maintain the stability of the system? So uh, starting from this 80% uh, case, grid falling inverter case, and we know we see that it's unstable. And then we start to add some uh, grid falling inverters, uh, add some grid forming inverters in the system to see uh, if they, can, they are able to improve the system stability or not. 
you can see that for this 80% IBR case, grid falling case, when we replace maybe around 5% of this grid falling versus with grid forming, we can see that uh, the oscillation disappear and the frequency stability nadar point is improved a little bit for this ground curve. This is about still 80% IBR, but with 5% grid forming uh, and the rest of the uh, grid following. You can see even with 5% uh, grid forming working in the system, the system frequency stability is improved a lot. And if we go higher, if we, because you know people are talking about 100% renewables, I know it's not realistic because it's not realistic, but from the simulation studies, we can take a look at that. But you know, with the high, higher penetration of grid forming in the system, we can see the system becomes even more and more stable. That just shows the, uh, the, the beneficial, the potential beneficial a benefits the grid forming inverters can bring to the system. It can solve the stability issues and improve the system frequency stability as the penetration of grid forming inverters increase in the system. So eventually we go to 100% IBR case. I know it's not realistic for today's power grid, but this is a simulation study we want to take a look to in the future scenario, potentially still future scenario. In this case, we have around 12% of grid forming inverters in the system. And you can see that they are good enough to uh, maintain the stability of the uh, power grid for this uh, scenario. <clears throat> so this is just use case uh, for uh, for to show what the benefit of the grid forming inverters can bring to the system. And also, I like to mention that the grid forming technology is still a relatively new uh, technology. There are manufacturers. There are many manufacturers can de uh, deploy this technology, but the technology itself is still uh, evolving uh, very fast. So PNL is also working with our industry partners, inverter manufacturers, on uh, keep the, uh, improving and developing, uh, enhancing these models. For example, uh, this is a, a, the most recent model we, we are developing in collaboration with uh, uh, General Electric, GE, and also APRI, because we know in the grid forming technology, there are two kind of grid forming technology. One is a droop control based grid forming technology. That model was covered by our previous uh, model introduced REGF MA1 that represents the droop control based grid forming technology. And this is a new uh, model called REGF MB1 that represents a virtual synchronous machine based grid forming technology. There are also some manufacturer, manufacturers are using this technology like GE and uh, uh, Siemens. So we're also collaborating with them on developing this technology uh, to to, to elaborate our models in, uh, in, the model in the WEC model library. So finally, after talking about uh, a lot of these models and how these models can influence the system planning studies, I like to talk about the real world demonstration project of the grid forming inverter. So you can see that in the past several years, uh, we are working with uh, the transmission planning engineers to help them to run the simulation studies to see how this technology can be beneficial for their power grid. So after they using these models and they understand this technology better, they're very interested to see how this technology can be uh, deployed in the real world to see how they can bring the, uh, to see the real world demonstration perspective, how they can be beneficial for the power grid. So recently we, uh, we had got a new uh, demonstration project awarded uh, as shown in these slides. It's a 380 megawatt combined wind, solar, and battery storage power plant demonstration project. Uh, this power plant is in Oregon area. It's called Wheat Ridge Power Plant. This is, I think many people may hear about this, uh, may hear about this power plant because it's a very unique site. This is the first energy, energy center and also the only, si only energy center in the US to combine wind, solar, and energy storage together at one location. So it's, it's a very unique site. And for this demonstration project, we are, what we are doing, what we are going to do is that we will change a portion of the wind turbines and the batteries to update their controls from today's grid falling to grid forming. So we will change a portion of the wind turbines and the batteries to grid forming, and then see how they can provide beneficial a benefits to the power system. <clears throat> and also by doing so. You know, in this side, it has solar, solar, wind, energy storage, and also it will have a combination of grid forming and grid falling technologies. So in this, in this way, we are able to see how this new technology, when they are being applied to battery and wind turbines, how they can provide uh, benefits to power grid and how, this, how their dynamic response 
uh, are beneficial, uh, you know, are, are better than the grid for following version in this side. We are able to show that. And for this demonstration project, you know, this project was led by the uh, is led by the Portland General Electric. This is a utility. Uh, it's a utility local utility, and also it's a co-owner of this power plant. And another co-owner of this power plant is Next Era. So this uh, this is a power plant owner. And also the manufacturer is a GE. We also we will collaborate with GE and GE will update a portion of their uh, wind turbines to grid forming and also install a new grid forming battery in the system to show the grid for how this grid forming technology can be applied on both wind turbine and, uh, and the, the <clears throat> batteries. And also we have BPA as a system operator. Uh, BPA uh, is also very interesting in this technology. Uh, they want to see how this technology can impact their power grid. So in this role, BPA will serve as a system operator role, and they have a very good PMU network, and also they have the many um, uh, data capture uh, equipment uh, equipment to capture those events to see, uh, for example, when a fault event happens in the system, uh, we, we want to monitor how this grid forming inverter responds to this fault, how the grid forming inverter responds to this fault. Then we can better understand how this uh, grid forming technology uh, is and how and whether they are able to pro provide benefits to the system. So uh, you can see that in this project team, we have utility, power plant owner, system operator, manufacturer, national lab, and also we have ut a, a university partner to do the R&D research. So we'll work together on this uh, project. Uh, this project just just started actually uh, this uh, uh, this month, actually. We just, no, last month, we just started this uh, uh, this project recently, and this is a three-year project. At the, at the end of the project, we are going to see how this grid forming technology will be demonstrating the real world and the impact their power grid. So in my mind, it's a really uh, exciting opportunity because I'm not sure you know that or not, because for this technology, uh, there are a lot of deployments in other parts of the world, like Australia, they have already deployed a lot of grid forming batteries like Tesla, Hitachi, and uh, Siemens SMA, they deployed a lot of grid forming batteries in their power grid. And also in, in the US, in the Hawaii Island, they also have uh, many grid forming batteries in, the, in their power grid. But in the, in the continent power grid, we don't see too many grid forming uh, in the system. I guess that is still because the penetration of renewable is still not that high in the continental power grid. But I think this demonstration project is really uh, beneficial to show how this technology can be beneficial for power grid. And also, also this is the first time this kind of um, uh, uh, grid connected battery, a grid forming inverter to be connected to the US block power system for the continental power grid. So this is very uh, exciting uh, opportunity to me. Okay, so then I'm going to draw my conclusion. So as I mentioned that I think as the penetration of inverters continue to increase in power system, we believe the grid forming technology will play a very important role in maintaining the system stability. And also for PNL in the past several years, we are collaborating with WEC to develop this uh, grid forming inverter model and get them included in the commercial simulation tools. So transmission planning engineers can use this model to evaluate how this uh, technology can be beneficial for their power grade. And also accurate grid forming inverter models are critical for the power system planning studies. So we think, you know, as I mentioned, this grid forming technology itself still evolves, evolves very fast. So we will collaborate, uh, continue developing and enhancing these models in collaboration with our uh, industry partners uh, to further uh, uh, you know, expand and enhance these models for uh, long-term transmission, or not only long-term for transmission planning and operation studies. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm open to any questions. Hey, Dr. Du, thank you. That was uh, terrific and uh, really um, useful information. I think we uh, just got a quick question here. I know we're a little bit over time, but um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll go to a question. How feasible is it to retrofit the existing inverter controls with new firmware to enable grid forming technology? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of people, a lot of people are asking this question. Uh, uh, when we, based on our interaction with many, many manufacturers like SMA and Tesla and even GE, 
for the for the batteries, I think they can do retrofit. They already confirmed that you know, uh, for the batteries, they can they can use the change the existing grid fall inverters to grid forming with not too much cost. It's basically a, basically a hard uh, for firmware update, so they can do that. But uh, for grid forming technology for wind and solar, I guess uh, you can see this still at the demonstration project. So I would say for grid forming battery, it's very mature and people can do retrofit. But for grid for uh, for the wind and the solar, uh, I would say we have we are seeing this demonstration project. Like for this project, if we are successful, uh, GE will show that they can also retrofit their grid uh, their grid following wind to the uh, to the grid forming. But this is still a demonstration project. No no product yet. But for batteries are also already very mature. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you again. Um... We'll go ahead and uh, take a break. We'll come back here in 10 minutes. So we'll start back up again at uh, 2.25 Eastern time. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Who works as a system, who works as a system engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She leads the energy policy team at PNNL and her work centers on renewable energy, the power grid, and the energy water nexus opportunities, climate resilience, and utility regulation. So Juliet, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me get into screen share mode here. Good. Okay, great. So hi everyone. Um, I'm happy to be with you today. I'm going to talk about resilience and resource adequacy, and I'm going to focus a lot on climate resilience uh, because I've been doing a lot of work in this area, and it kind of builds on what you heard from Natalie Voisin earlier. Um, so I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, background, and then I'm going to talk at length about climate change and resource planning and how that relates to resource adequacy. I'll provide a few examples and talk about the important role of data and, and some data sources and then touch on the roles for regulators. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work in this area through uh, DOE's Water Power Technologies Office. So we've done a, a report, a number of reports recently about um, electric utilities and planning for uh, climate change um, and climate variability. We, um, as Elliot mentioned earlier, we released a report in May that's emerging best practices for electric utilities uh, planning with climate variability. And it's meant to be a resource for utilities and regulators. Um, and we've done another, we did another report where we looked around at a bunch of integrated resource plans and, and looked at how utilities are planning uh, for variations in water and also for climate change. Um, and we have a few other reports here that, that you'll have access to uh, when you get these slides. So as I said, with our report on, on IRPs, we looked around the country at 30 different integrated resource plans um, and looked at best practices for analyzing and reporting on potential water base and climate change risks. Um, and as Natalie said, you know, there's a lot of the power systems that, that is dependent upon water for thermoelectric cooling or for hydropower. Um, and so we wanted to see, you know, how are utilities looking at uh, potential changes to water availability uh, in their IRPs, and then we broadened that to look at how they're looking at, at climate change more generally. And, you know, kind of the conclusions of that work, of that, that uh, report, were that, you know, there's a few things that, that are working together to kind of uh, really impact the risks uh, in this space. So, as I mentioned, water availability can impact the amount and timing of power generation, both in terms of thermal plants and hydro. Um, and changing temperatures from climate change can lead to changes in the loads, uh, a lot of new air conditioners and things like that, and the availability of demand side resources. And at the same time, changing resource mixes um, and can impact you know, wholesale power mar markets and prices, um, and those can be impacted by the changing resource mix, but also changing loads. Um, and then, of course, reliability uh, can also be impacted by extreme events that are uh, can be worsened by climate change and changing loads and generation. And then there are these interregional effects that Natalie spoke about a little bit, that where the hydro in the Pacific Northwest can impact what's happening in the Southwest and vice versa. Uh, so these interregional impacts also need to be considered. And, and taken together, you know, these represent cumulative areas of significant potential uncertainty and impact. 
And so I think as regulators, it's important to talk about these issues with uh, your utilities and make sure they're looking at um, these risks. So I think there's an interesting lesson learned from that power outages in California back in 2020. Um, so, you know, there were, uh, as it was an extreme heat storm uh, across the Western US in 2020 that resulted in electricity demand exceeding electricity resource planning targets. So uh, was, there was not an adequate amount of resources. So resource adequacy was not met in that case. Um, and this required California utilities to have rolling service cuts due to the shortage of electricity. And after the fact, after these outages, there was a kind of a root cause analysis done by California ISO, and they, they determined that existing resource planning processes do not adequately account for climate change impacts. Um, and so they found that, you know, the, the planning that they were doing was based on, you know, historic average peak demand. Um, and even with the 15% planning reserve margin, this was not sufficient uh, for the 2020 heat wave. And if you were participating on the session earlier this week, you, you know, Todd Levin talked a bit, quite a bit about the planning reserve margin. So different resource adequacy uh, techniques are needed, but also, you know, thinking of the new kind of new weather patterns, we can't just necessarily rely on past weather um, to, to forecast and make sure we have resource adequacy going forward. Um, and you know, one of the things that's being done, rather than you know, I think I used to myself work for the Oregon Public Utility Commission, and you know, we worked a lot with utilities and their their planning, and and a lot of times the the future forecasts were based on historic um, her historic peaks or historic averages, um, but I think a lot of utilities or some utilities are starting to recognize that with with kind of the way the climate's shifting, we need to we can't just rely on the past to predict the future, and so. Folks are looking at what we call downscaling global climate models, uh, where they um, it's a technique where they translate large scale global general what they're called general circulation models or GCMs into more localized results. Um, and GCMs or these uh, general circulation models are complex models of the Earth's climate that consider the main components of land, oceans, atmosphere, and sea ice and their interactions. And through the process of downscaling, scientists can then understand how climate change will impact local and regional climates. Of course, it's not an exact science, it's not perfect, but it can be directionally correct and help provide some insights into what, what we might uh, expect to see in the future with different levels of warming. Um, and so if you look at some of this, the science, you'll see these terms, this RCP term used a lot, and RCP means a representative concentration pathway. Um, and it basically, it's just a, a case that scientists use uh, where they predict different climate futures based on different emission trajectories. And then they, that becomes like a scenario, a climate scenario or case. And so you'll often see RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. RCP 4.5 is, is not as, as dire a situation, you might say. It's uh, assuming that we'll get, we'll reduce our emissions um, to a certain degree, whereas RCP 8.5 assumes that globally the emissions won't be reduced as much. And so the global um, climate change impacts may be more significant. Um, so another thing, term you might hear if you're looking at this work is the SSPs or shared so so socioeconomic pathways. And that's again, another way to kind of show different scenarios because uh, it's not a deterministic thing. It's not like this is what we're gonna see. It's like, there's so many things that it's gonna be dependent upon. And so you'll see different RCPs or SSPs. And then you'll also hear maybe CMIP, which is a coupled model error in your comparison project which is a global co coordinated modeling uh, initiative designed to better understand climate change from various sources. Um, and so you'll see scenarios and, and see MIPS. So as I talk about best practices, I'll, I'll refer back to that downscaling a little bit more. But another example that I wanna talk about when I'm talking about resource adequacy and, and climate resilience is you know, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council or NWPCC or sometimes call it the council you know, they develop um, these power plans every five years and, and the Northwest Power uh, Conservation Council is a unique regional power planning organization that was established through an act of Congress, I think in either the late seventies or the early eighties. And so they develop these regional power plans every five years. And I think the Power Council has done a good job at really looking at, at how to incorporate uh, potential climate change into resource planning and resource adequacy. So the Power Council, took the results from 10 different general circulation models or GCM studies. And then they downscaled that global information down to the Pacific Northwest region. And then they teamed up with 
a number of folks from the Bonneville Power Administration, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, as well as University of Washington and Oregon State. And they developed this group called the RMJOC, the River Management Joint Operating Committee. And, and this group together performed that, that downscaling. Um, and then they had a bunch of public meetings and they did different methods and different hydrologic models and different scenarios to come up with the, some idea of what the future might look like. Um, and they found in their power plan that the seasonality of the electricity demand will shift in the future based on, on this downscaling. And so the, the dashed line in this figure shows the kind of historic um, temperatures from you know, 1949 to 2018. And you can see that there's a it's a winter peaking situation here in the past with the dashed line where the peak is there in January. Um, and then the red line shows that what's expected in the future when you're forecasting out using these global climate models from 2020 to 2029. So you can see the winter demand is expected to go down in the Northwest United States and the um, summer demand is expected to increase. Now this next slide I, I think is pretty interesting um, and it's also from the Power Council, but it, it talks about how the, the shift in the loss of load probability over time. So as they're doing planning, they're looking at what's the loss of load probability at different times of year. And they, the Power Council did this interesting exercise where they, they calculated loss of load probability based on different historic data sets. So on the left here, we have, they used data from 1949 to 1978. And they, they used that to look at what the loss of load probability would be in each month. So based on that kind of far past historic data, the loss of load probability was peaked at 27.5% in January. Um, but then if they use more recent past data from 1979 to 2008, the loss of low probability in the summer or in the winter, excuse me, went down to 13.2. And in the summer, it started to increase. And then if they used on the far right here, if they use the climate change forecast, then the loss of low probability in the winter went almost down to nothing and it increased in the summer. So all of this to say that if, if folks are just using historic data, they may be building the wrong things. They may be building for a loss of load probability like here on the left or in the middle. Whereas what the future may actually look like is, is a, a higher loss of load probability in the summer. So that means different resources uh, would be needed to maintain resource adequacy. Um, so just a little bit of summary slide here that, you know, the key point, one of the key points of, uh, is that the weather of the past is not necessarily representative of the weather of the future. So if you're planning for the weather of the past, you may be planning for the, the, the wrong thing. Some of the different approaches that we've seen is sometimes people don't have the capacity to do detailed downscaling and, and look at that. So some folks are just trying to weight the more recent years uh, more heavily in, in forecasting or applying trends in the number of like heating degree days and cooling degree days that are expected. So they're saying like, we're seeing more heating degree days each year and kind of extrapolating that forward. It's, you know, it's it's better than nothing. Uh, and I think it's, it's interesting to note. Um, also, another thing to note is that need to look at the availability of supply side resources. Um, some there's some papers out there that talk about how with climate change, you know, the um, outages at nuclear power plants are are increasing um, somewhat. There's some nice um, studies in the literature on that. And then the the figure here on the lower right is from um, I think it's from SoCal Edison, Southern California Edison. They did their climate vulnerability assessment. And in California, the California Public Utility Commission requires all the investor-owned utilities to do these detailed vulnerability assessments, climate vulnerability and adaptation plans. Um, and so with SoCal Edison, they did that and, and they looked at the potential increase in thermal resource outages due to extreme heat. You know, in every area and every region is going to have different potential um, climate impacts, but in 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 uh, California, they're really looking at extreme heat. And this analysis showed that over time, by like 2070, there could be uh, like an 1800% increase in outage risk due to uh, extreme heat uh, of, for their thermal resources. So in, in addition to looking at potential impacts to loads of uh, higher temperatures, looking at impacts to thermal resources is also important. Uh, the figure on, on the top here is from Con Edison's climate change vulnerability study. They're also a leader and have done some interesting work. They, they're looking at for these different RCPs, what the temperatures might be going forward that they need to plan for. Okay, no model is perfect. Um, and so there's also a need to address uncertainty in planning. And there's a kind of a whole science around what's called DMDU or decision-making under deep uncertainty. 
and deep uncertainty is more than just you know uncertainty around you know fuel prices or uh, traditional kind of uh, uh, stochastic things that you might vary stochastically in a, in a uh, scenario analysis. And this is more kind of climate level uncertainty is considered deep uncertainty. Um, and so there's some approaches with, that say, you know, rather than trying to think we can determinist, determin deterministically project what the future will bring, you know, we need to really look at the system and identify what are the the key system thresholds uh, and key components that need to be maintained uh, to maintain system stability and plan for ways to maintain those under a number of different potential futures. Um, and so there's a whole kind of science around this and it's interesting to look at. Um, another example I wanna to point to is Seattle City Light. They also did a climate vulnerability assessment kind of a while back. Uh, and I thought it was, I think it's very kind of simple and elegant the way they did this is, they first identified what are their main risks that they're subject to. And I said, as I said, each area is going to be different in terms of what they might um, need to plan for. But for Seattle, they identified these, I think, seven uh, or these eight um, risks to their their potential, their system. And in the circles here on the top of this, where they looked at sea level rise, warming temperatures, extreme weather, wildfires, you know, in, in this area, they've got a lot of risks for, for landslides and erosion. So they, they laid those out and then they, uh, in the uh, rectangles here, they identified key, key utility functions that need they need to maintain. And then they mapped impact pathways between the potential threats to the, the system operations. Um, and then they took those impact pathways and they kind of this, uh, what seems like a somewhat simplistic assessment of those, but I think it still is really useful where they kind of looked at the impacts and then they looked at the vulnerability in terms of the exposure level, for, for both like near term and longer term, the sensitivity, and then the capacity of the system to adapt naturally, uh, and then the potential magnitude of the impacts based on these different um, impact pathways. And then from all of that, they identified these adaptation actions and prioritized these adaptation actions that they wanted to take. And so I think, as I said, some public utility commissions now, I know New York, New York State has also required the electric utilities to do this kind of systematic assessment of their system, looking at the system, looking at how they might be impacted by climate change, and then looking at how they can proactively um, develop some adaptation strategies. And of course, it's, uh, it costs, it's not free for the utilities to do this. It, it, it does, it takes some expense. It's, it's some level of cost, um, but it, it can be beneficial. Um, in that as utilities are moving forward with in, uh, making new investments, they can make sure that those are kind of climate ready um, investments. Um, just a quick note on data, you know, this idea of downscaling climate models can be somewhat time consuming and uh, extensive. And so a lot of times we're seeing utilities that are teaming up with university partners um, and other organizations to, to gather information about what to plan for. Um, California did a, a statewide climate change assessment and then from that made a lot of their data in, available to everyone on a web portal called Cal Adapt, so that it's not like each utility or municipality needs to do its own version of this downscaling, but they're able to um, rely on this very granular um, data that's available on a statewide basis uh, for everybody to plan for, um, for precipitation, sea level rise and temperatures. Um, so partnerships can be key here. And you know, regulators, we think, have really important roles here. I think regulators can establish clear goals and expectations and metrics, um, and including identifying risks utilities should plan for and what data sets they could use uh, to, to plan for those. And they could ask the questions. I think regulators can just ask questions to what extent the utilities are looking at these things and, and how. Um, and utilities can, regulators can also require utilities to systematically review their risks and assets and then prioritize the risks and ultimately potentially consider climate readiness in, in prudence type reviews, given that, you know, this climate kind of information has been available for some time now. And so at some point, uh, you know, it could be a kind of a prudence issue of whether the investments are being made uh, and being informed by the information that we have about what, what the future may hold when it comes to uh, climate. So some closing remarks, um, the weather of the, uh, the future may not be uh, what we represent, the weather of the past, excuse me, may not be representative of the weather of the future. Downscaling global climate models can be a, a good way to look at what the future may bring, um, but we don't know exactly what the future will bring and the, the climate science is still evolving. So robust and flexible adaptive approaches are needed. 
um, and least regret approaches that identify critical system thresholds and then find ways to really strengthen those thresholds given a range of different climate futures. Um, smaller utilities can learn from uh, larger and more resourced utilities. And there are a lot of publicly available data sets. PNNL has some excellent data. There's this whole new national climate assessment. There's CalADAPT. I mean, there's no shortage of information, but I think sometimes it requires uh, climate scientists to help identify what are the best data sets to use for specific questions that, that utilities or regulators might have. Um, each state and utility will be different and will have their own needs and priorities, but regulators can play a, an important role. Uh, stakeholder engagement is really important um, and uh, equity can also really be an important thing to look at as you're looking at potential impacts and, of climate change. Um, and yeah, working across traditional silos is, is another kind of best practice that we found in our in our work. Uh, I did this work with my colleague, Alan Cook. So there's a nice picture of Alan here and uh, our emails, some links to the reports that I mentioned. So thank you very much. Hey, th thank you, Juliet. That was terrific. Um, looking for any questions as a reminder, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A um, if you have any questions for Juliet. I guess um, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, you showed some examples of climate studies, um, I think somewhere in California and in the Con Edison example. Those seem to be focused on, I think, extreme heat. Um, are there notable examples of studies to examine extreme cold? Because, you know, think about winter storm URI, uh, more of kind of a fuel supply and delivery and, and sort of broad failure of um, various system components. Uh, and then August 2020 in the in the West, you seem to it seemed to be more of a uh, resources insufficient resources uh, challenge during prolonged uh, extreme demand. So maybe you could just briefly speak to the different studies that look at extreme heat versus extreme um, cold. Yeah, you know that, that's a great question, uh, and I feel like the stuff that that we've looked at hasn't really addressed extreme cold uh, as much, right? The, I think the extreme heat, the the sea level rise is is a big one. Um, you know, Florida, there's a number of utilities down there that are doing these storm protection plans where they're looking at you know intense storms. Um, so I'm sure they're being done, but I don't know about them. And I, I think sometimes the ones that we've looked at were you know like as Seattle City Light did theirs back in like 2015. Con Edison started theirs and you know, 2019, and I think wrapped the first one up in, in 2021. So I don't know that there are a lot that have been conducted since like Winter Storm Uri and, and some of these these cold snaps have been more pronounced, but I know there is the new requirement, you know, the, the new cold weather standard that NERC is developing. So I think there's a lot of movement in that area, but I don't know of the kind of the extensive and comprehensive climate vulnerability assessments that look very much at the extreme cold. Yeah, of the, at least the ones we've looked at. Thanks again, and uh, I guess we'll uh, keep moving here into our final presentation. Great, okay. Uh, so we're gonna hear from Jeremy Twitchell, um, also with PNNL, about uh, energy storage as a transmission asset. All right. And Jeremy Twitchell, I'll give you a quick Introduction here. You're a senior analyst at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, where you lead a research program focused on identifying the regulatory barriers that impede the development of energy storage technologies and best practices for reducing or eliminating those barriers. He also supports other efforts at the lab in areas related to grid planning, utility regulation, rate design, and energy system equity. Prior to joining PNNL, Jeremy worked at the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. So Jeremy, um, it's all yours and thank you. All right, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, I my work headphones died this morning and after screaming my way through another webinar presentation because my laptop microphone is terrible, I switched to my personal headphones. So I'm glad they're working. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, as Elliot said, I, I worked at the Utility Commission for several years before coming to PNNL. So I'm always very happy to support commissions and support an area however I can. And, you know, hopefully there's there's something of value for you, uh, for all of you in the work you're doing today. Um, so I was asked to present some of the work we've been doing looking at energy storage as a transmission asset. 
Yeah, let me just begin by saying that uh, the work I'm presenting today was funded by the Department of Energy through the Watt, some of it through the Water Power Technologies Office and some of it through the Office of Electricity. And we're grateful for the support of those two offices in this, this, this fascinating area that we've been working in. Um, so just kind of an overview of what I'll be talking about today. So we'll, we'll talk about the policy framework first, like some of the things that have teed up this idea of using storage on the transmission system. Then we'll get into kind of a more technical definition, like what do we say, what, what do we mean when we say storage is transmission? What are the specific use cases that it's uh, supporting and the benefits it's providing to the system? And we'll have some case studies, some examples of those different benefits. And then we'll get into this dual use energy storage idea that FERC teed up a couple years ago, uh, actually a few years ago now, uh, where they suggested that energy storage could be used as both a regulated transmission asset and a competitive market asset and earn money on both sides of the ledger there. Um, still just a theoretical idea has not been put in practice yet, but I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing to try to think through what it would take to enable that kind of use. All right, so policies. So our story begins in 2003, the great, the last great blackout, fingers crossed. Um, so in 2003, as you can see there, PJM is still a small footprint. Um, MISO has not yet expanded. Um, so throughout the, the Eastern Interconnect, you still had a lot of bouncing authority areas, a lot of utilities managing their own systems. And so each one of those bubbles is a balancing area. And there was a malfunctioning switch on a transmission line in that bubble there in Ohio, uh, First Energy, that caused the largest blackout in US history. Um, as you can see, it spread throughout much of the Northeast into Canada, Detroit, New York, Buffalo, Boston, all major cities that uh, lost power. And it's important to note, this was not caused by any external impact to the grid. There wasn't a storm, there wasn't high wind, nobody crashed into a pole, a switch malfunctioned and nobody noticed until it had cascaded into this. So in response to that, Congress said, we need, we need an entity that can develop reliability standards for the grid. So the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which used to be an industry association that developed voluntary standards, was tasked to be the entity that would develop mandatory standards um, for electric utilities. On the for for the transmission planning standard uh, TPL-01-5, this and uh, this applies to all transmission owning entities in the U.S. Even those in Texas who aren't under FERC jurisdiction, they are under NERC jurisdiction. And you know this is a very complex. Uh, requirement, very complex standard written by engineers for engineers, but for our purposes here, we can boil it down into really two key requirements. Any entity that owns a transmission system has to have a working model of that transmission system, a working power flow model. And then every year they have to use that power flow model to test the grid, test their system, identify potential weaknesses, and present a strategy for uh, correcting those weaknesses. So our new paradigm here for transmission planning that comes out of all this is the contingency-based analysis. So really what planners are doing, it's kind of a fun job if you think about it, they're taking the system and they're trying to think of all the creative ways that it could break. You know, what happens if this power line goes down? What happens if this uh, power plant goes down? What happens if they both go down or one goes down and one causes the other? So that's where we get, you know, N minus one, N minus one, minus one, N minus two, all these scenarios that planners look at. What could happen and does the grid respond? And then what they do with that planning model is they look at what happens to the grid in that contingency event. And then NERC has standards that says, okay, for each of these events, there are limits in terms of how far it can spread, um, how fast the system can be restored and things like that and anywhere that, they, that the planners identify a violation of that standard where the system impacts exceed the, the limits set in the standard, they have to come up with a corrective action plan that says, okay, here's how we're going to address this. Um, historically, that's been done through just additional redundancy in the transmission system, more poles, more wires. But now energy storage has emerged as a viable alternative for a lot of these contingency scenarios. You know, it, it can't move energy storage, energy storage can't move energy from one place to another. 
from point A to point B. But because it can move energy through time, it can hold energy and then inject it in a contingency event in a way that can help um, resolve that contingency and help to keep, keep the system in compliance. And where feasible, where we can do this, using storage as a transmission asset, it can extend the life of the existing infrastructure by protecting it. It can defer or displace the need for additional transmission infrastructure as well. So Congress kind of locked onto this idea in 2005, and in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, they identified energy storage as an advanced transmission technology because it could be used to help the system operate more efficiently. FERC in 2007 issued Order 890. This is the one where they told transmission owning entities that they had to have transparent um, planning processes for their systems. FERC also said that planners have to consider non-transmission alternatives in that planning process. Then in 2011, FERC came back with Order 1000 and said, we like transparent planning. We want to do it on a regional basis now. So utilities have to coordinate across regions. You can see in that map there the, the Order 1000 regions that have been set up. And also FERC says, in terms of that, those non-transmission alternatives, you need to have a written process. You need to have some transparency about how you will conduct those analyses. And then finally, Order 8784 in 2013, not as interesting, but just as important because that was the signal to utilities that they really could use storage as a transmission asset because now there's an account where they can where they can um, put those investments. So storage is transmission, what do we mean? So the key principle to keep in mind here is uh, thermal limits. So the, the metals that we move in transmission line, excuse me, that we use in transmission lines to move electricity, they're not perfect conductors. So as electricity moves through, they heat up. So we get line losses in the form of heat. Those metals expand, which causes sagging. And so because this phenomenon, phenomenon, when we're talking about the rating of a transmission line, we're not necessarily talking about how much electricity can move through it. We're talking about its temperature. And that temperature is going to be subject to a lot of things, not just how much electricity is moving through it, but what is the ambient temperature? What is the wind like? What is the humidity like? And so on a, from a dynamic standpoint, the actual electricity rating or energy rating of a transmission line is going to be variable. So energy storage can be a potential alternative to, uh, to managing, to, to avoiding that thermal overload. We can put it in a load center so that we have to move less electricity through the transmission line so we can defer expansions and um, additions of additional lines. So I said addition twice there, additions of line, uh, line additions. Um, we can use storage to maintain voltage, to manage power flows. We can use it to maintain service in a contingency event. You know, customers that would otherwise lose service, that storage can pick them up. And now this is an important point, and I'm glad I'm talking to regulators who will get this because most people eyes glass over on this, but it matters. Um, storage can be deployed as a regulated transmission asset or in place of transmission as a competitive generation asset. That distinction is lost on most people. I know it's not lost on you all. Now, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So a few examples of sto where storage has been used as a transmission asset first. So this one from MISO, the 2019 MISO transmission expansion plan. So the wild pocket area that you can see there, there's a 345 KV line that comes up one side, crosses, and then goes up the other side. And then there's some service lines that, that drop into wild pocket. If there were an outage on one of those lines through a, a series of things that would happen after that, wild pocket would be cut off. And so they looked at a couple options. They looked at adding an additional line for more redundancy. But then they realized, you know, MISO planners, they realized that if they put a storage project in the middle of town and they put some capacitors on there so that they could segment the line, then if there's an outage on either side, this, the, line, the capacitors can segment the line and the storage can pick up the side that has the outage on, that had the outage. And this was about a million dollars cheaper than the, the additional line. So this is a transmission asset. It is deployed, excuse me, all of its costs are recovered through MISO's transmission tariff. It does not participate in energy markets. It does not earn market revenue. Another example, this was kind of the, the first modern example of using storage as a transmission asset, came out of Kaiso in 2018. Uh, there's this little town in Dinuba in Central California. And you can see on the our little diagram there, 
there's a 230 kV line that kind of goes alongside Dinuba, and then there's a little 70 kV line that comes off of deserved Dinuba. They identified a contingency where if there's an outage on that upstream portion of the 230 kV system, then there's way too much energy flowing over that 70 kV line and it could blow it out. So they looked at reconducting that line to just have higher capacity, but there's not a lot of load growth there and they're like, they didn't need it. They, you know, it would just be there for that contingency. So they found it would be a little bit cheaper to put an energy storage system at that substation and it effectively would act like a sponge. So in that contingency event, all that, all that energy coming into that substation that needs to go somewhere, that battery soaks up what that 70 kV system can't take. And same thing here, this is, a trend, this is proposed as a transmission asset, regulated asset, cost recovered through the KISO transmission tariff, no market revenue, no market participation. And then as far as I know, this is the oldest example of this idea. In fact, it's so old, I don't think they even classified it as a transmission asset because no one had thought of that yet. Um, but if it were to be done today, it would be classified as a transmission asset. But so Rocky Mountain Power in Utah, they had a really long, really low voltage KV line that served this little town of Castle Rock in eastern Utah, excuse me, Castle Valley, 209 miles, 20 KV. So by the end of that, when that line gets into Castle Valley, they have a lot of voltage issues, a lot of, uh, a lot of reliability issues. They couldn't get any economic development in the place because they had such poor reliability. Um, this line runs through a lot of sensitive areas, so upgrading it was not very feasible. So by putting the storage system, and this is actually one of the first uses of a flow battery as well, way back in 2004. By putting a flow battery at the end of the line, that injected enough voltage into the system to maintain voltage and maintain reliability, even at the end of that really long low voltage radial line. Um, so those last three examples, we're talking about storage as transmission. Regulated assets not participating in markets. We're going to flip it and go to the other side of the spectrum now. We're going to talk about storage in place of transmission. So in Oakland, California, they had a 165 megawatt jet-fueled combustion turbine plant. And if you're like me, you did not know that was a thing. In 2017, it was identified for closure because it was old. It had a really bad emissions profile, and it, it was within a, a block of residents. So they decide to shut it down, but when they're doing the transmission plan, they recognize that if any one of those transmission lines coming into the Oakland area goes down, there's not enough local capacity now to maintain service. So they looked at building new capacity, they looked at building another line, and what they settled on was actually a proposal from the transmission owning entity, which was uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, and the community choice aggregator that served load in the area. Um, East Bay Community Energy. They had a joint proposal in which uh, PG&E would build about 44, 45 megawatts of behind the meter, utility scale behind the meter storage. And then East Bay Community Energy would work with its customers to deploy behind the meter solar, behind the meter storage um, to, to put more capacity in the load pocket. Um, this one was a an economic no-brainer, uh, more than $260 million cheaper to go this route than the next best option. Important to note, none of these assets are transmission assets, not the utility scale storage, not the behind the meter stuff. They are all market assets who can participate in energy markets, capacity markets. And by virtue of them being there and providing that service, the additional transmission lines are not required. So we've avoided that transmission with a generation asset or with a, a market asset, I should say. All right. So moving on to dual use storage. Another key principle here, transmission utilization. So all transmission lines, pretty much all transmission lines, fully contracted. Someone owns all the rights to use them. But if you think about it, we've designed the system based on peak demand plus reserve margins plus um, redundancy to meet reliability needs to meet contingencies. So under normal operating conditions, we're operating way lower than the, the rated capacity of that system. And so WEC, the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, studied this back in 2018. And they looked at all the paths that run through the Western US. And they found that 
on average, well, you'll see those numbers on the bottom right, U75 and U90. U75 means the percentage of time that that pathway exceeded 75% of its rate of capacity, and U90 is the amount of time that it exceeded 90% of its rate of capacity. So as you can see there, it, the average pathway in the West only exceeds 75% of its rate of capacity 6% of the time, and only exceeds 90% of its rate of capacity a little more than 1% of the time. And even in those high use numbers, you know, path one, path 19, that U90 number is still only about 4%. So if it's a transmission line, it's binary, right? It's moving electricity or it's doing nothing. That excess capacity can't do anything else when it's available. If we've deployed energy storage as a transmission asset and it follows the same usage pattern, when it's not being used for that contingency event, there is a lot of other things that it can do. A lot of other ways we can use that. And so FERC locked onto this idea back in 2017, and they put out this this kind of this policy statement that kind of flew under the radar in a lot of ways. Um, but what FERC said is, hey, we're open to this idea of using energy storage both as a regulated transmission asset and as a competitive market asset, and allowing it to earn money on both, as long as it's not double recovering its cost. It doesn't have unfair access to the market. And the ISO is not compromised in their role as the, the arbiter of the grid, the independent operator. FERC's objective here is to reduce system costs. That's the, that's the big prize that they see. So we put just a generic example of what that looks like there on the right. So if we just have this $10 million transmission asset that can return $50,000 a year in market revenue to customers, then over 40 years, it's gonna return $2 million. And on a net present value basis, that $10 million asset actually only costs customers about $9.5 million. So that's what FERC sees, that's the value that they see in using storage as a dual use asset. They put out this policy statement encouraging ISOs to think about it, to use these guiding principles and develop something. Kaiso and MISO were the only two regions that tried to uh, they both have terminated those proceedings uh, without resolving it. And so what we wanted to do was kind of pick up where from where they left off, you know, learn from what they did and think through what would it take to really enable energy storage to be a dual use asset, to, to really unlock this value to customers that FERC identified. So the first thing we looked at is, okay, if it's going to be a dual use asset, it's got to be a transmission asset first, right? Because transmission has much higher barriers to entry. You know, you can't you can come in as a transmission asset and then do other things, but it's really, really, really tough, if not impossible, to come in as a generation asset and then say, oh, and I'm also going to do transmission. So we assumed you have to be a transmission asset first. So we looked at transmission planning and we said, okay, all of this guidance is out there for energy storage as a transmission asset. But if you look around the country, it's still very, very rare that you see this type of analysis done where you see storage actually studied as an alternative. And part of that is because the way FERC's orders are written is it's dependent on stakeholders asking for the analysis. There's no requirement for ISOs to just do it. So, th and there's not a lot of clarity in most ISOs for stakeholders to understand how and when they can propose those alternatives, how they'll be studied. There's some difficulty in representing storage and power flow models. You know, power flow models are designed to just be real time, what's happening in the moment. And when you add an element that adds a time element that can move energy from one period to the next, um, power flow models don't like it very much. Um, you know, weak links between generation and transmission planning processes. So again, if we identify an opportunity for storage in place of transmission, like that California example, that worked in California because, you know, it's one state, everyone's kind of on the same page. So the ISO can recognize that and utilities can propose that and go to the state commission and get approval. If you're in a region like MICE or PJM, where you've got multiple states involved in the process and very distinct generation and transmission planning and development processes, that's a lot more difficult to have that linkage and say, okay, we can avoid a transmission investment if we can have storage here. Um, financial disincentives, you know, let's be honest, in a lot of regions, utilities are only allowed to earn and do certain things. Um, transmission investment is a very attractive investment. It is a guaranteed revenue stream with a, 
you know, uh, FERC rates of return tend to be higher than state rates of return, so a good rate of return. And if I'm a utility looking at a transmission investment, and then I'm told, oh, no, we're, we're going to do this alternative, well, in some regions, some states, I may not even be able to own that transmission. I may not even be able to develop it as a utility. So I'm looking at a lot of lost revenue if I look at this alternative. So there's a, there's a, an incentive for utilities to, to not look at storage alternatives. And then lack of regulatory review. You know, FERC doesn't look at transmission plans. They don't review them. So there, there's no one kind of, you know, cracking the whip to make sure that these analyses are being done. So when it comes to incorporating storage into the transmission planning process, you know, it's one of our, our key objectives into this, in this project was to not overthink things, to keep things simple, to, to work within existing frameworks as much as possible. And really what it comes down to is just, you know, having clear and transparent processes for how and when storage alternatives can be proposed and how they will be studied. And there's different ways of doing this. You know, uh, we identified two ends of the spectrum. In CAISO, they don't have anything written down per se, but they do allow stakeholders at the start of a transmission planning process to say, these are the preferred resources that we would like to be emphasized in this plan. Energy storage is one of those resources. And so that basically creates kind of a, a proactive requirement in some ways for planners to look for those storage alternatives and consider those storage alternatives. Again, CAISO, one state, one policy regime, that works. MISO, multiple states, multiple policy regimes, they had to be a lot more deliberate about how they did this. So MISO has a tariff it's called the SATOA tariff. That's storage is a transmission only asset that specifically spells out this is when you can propose a storage alternative. This is the information we need to require. This is what we're going to do with it. And recently, SPP and ISO New England have also adopted uh, similar tariffs to MISOs. And you know, if, if there's a potential for dual use, if there is a potential for the asset to participate in the market and earn market revenues, it's important to understand what those revenues could be and incorporate that forecast into the cost assumption of the asset. Because again, like we saw a couple slides ago, if I can earn market revenue on a net present value basis, my costs go down. So instead of being like a $10 million alternative, I might be a $9.5 million alternative. So that's an important thing to incorporate into the planning process. So market barriers to dual use storage. You know, again, we wanted to keep this simple and recognizing that there is no one size fits all solution. Every ISO has different rules, different resource mixes, different priorities, different policies. And so we didn't want to try and come up with a, you know, a, a silver bullet to this question. What we wanted to do is come up with a framework that says, okay, what are, the, what are the basic things that a dual use partition framework needs to do? What are the questions it needs to answer? And what are some options available to, to grid operators and policymakers? So the three basic questions we identified are when will the asset participate in the market? And so the objective here is to just ha allow the asset owner to be able to make informed bids into day ahead markets, to understand what the expectations will be for that asset from a transmission perspective and what, what room there is to participate in the market. Then how will the asset participate in the market? And the objective here, again, is to allow for kind of instant no-fault dispatch and redispatch of dual-use assets. So allow the asset to move freely between generation and transmission based on the grid needs and not penalize it as it moves back and forth. And then finally, where will the asset cover its costs? You know, again, it's earning some money as a regulated asset, as a transmission asset, it's earning some money as a competitive generation asset. FERC has said it can't double dip, it can't double recover. So there needs to be some balancing and some thought put into what it recovers on the transmission side and what it recovers on the generation side. So to that first point, the when, um, you know, creating that certainty for the, the asset owner is really about establishing market participation windows in advance. One of the things, one of the key points in FERC's policy statement was that ISO independence cannot be compromised. And so the way that's been interpreted is that when the asset is being used for transmission, it's under the control of the ISO, under control of the grid operator. When it's been released for market participation, it's under control of the asset owner. And that asset owner is the one making the bids and submitting it to the market. But in order to do that, there has to be some understanding about when it can do and what it can do. 
So a couple points of flexibility we identified to answer this question. Um, first one is to have predetermined eligibility windows. If we know the shape of that resilient of that reliability need of that contingency, like if we know it's only a problem during peak hours, we can say, all right, for these four or six peak hours, you are a transmission asset. The rest of the 24 hours, the rest of the day, you can be a generation asset as long as you come back to that next transmission window fully charged and ready to go. If we don't know when that contingency might happen, if it could happen at any time, then maybe there's some flexibility to allow the device to oversize a little bit and participate in the market subject to maintaining a certain state of charge floor um, that, that's equal to what the, the state of charge that it needs to perform its, its, uh, its contingency purpose, its reliability purpose. So how the asset participates in the market, you know, this is really about coming up with uh, asset, def asset definitions, market products. And what we found is that there are already a lot of um, asset classes and market products that exist that are really close to what dual use storage would be. So we don't have to reinvent any wheels. We can just kind of tweak some existing practices and processes to, to make it work. So for example, in terms of defining assets and like, you know, what this asset class is and what it can do and how it's dispatched, you know, a lot of ISOs have re rules for things like use limited resources, you know, those that can only be used a certain amount of times or certain times of the year, reliability constrained assets, very similar to what a dual, the, the limitations that a dual use storage asset would face when participating in the market. A uh, market product creation, most ISOs will allow uh, a market asset to to simultaneously bid into energy and ancillary service markets. And so really we think all we need to do there is just, you know, take it one step further and basically have a, a third function, a transmission function. You know, it can just be like a flag that signals to grid operators that this asset can be recalled in the event of a contingency or, you know, it will not be available in the event of a contingency. Um, bidding rules, you know, market mitigation is not a new thing to FERC or ISOs. This is one of their primary functions. So mitigating the, any benefits or advantages that a dual use asset might have is, is a fairly straightforward exercise. Um, one of the things to think about is, you know, if, if we've got a battery that we're using for this, batteries have limited number of cycle lives. And so every time we do a cycle in the market, that's a cycle we can't do for the reliability function. And so it probably not a good idea or may not be a good idea to deploy a battery that you think is gonna last 10 years, but then burn it out in the market and only get four years out of it. So one of the things you can do to, to diminish that advantage is, is make it bid in its, its full costs into the bid. What is the opportunity cost of using it for a market cycle and losing that cycle for the reliability, making sure that that cost is included in the bidding. Um, and then it may also make sense you just have market limitations. You know, if we're worried about this asset having an unfair advantage, maybe we limit how much capacity it can bid into the market. And finally, thinking about, you know, where the asset recovers its costs, you know, really we're, we're trying to, to balance different incentives and, um, excuse me, different objectives to incent market participation. So again, we're getting some from transmission, some from generation. We looked at Kaiso's proceeding, looked at a few different um, approaches. We looked at those. We we thought of a couple others. But the first idea Kaiso came up with is like, all right, we'll just allow it to recover all its asset, all its, excuse me, all its costs as a transmission asset. And then whatever it earns in the market, it returns to customers. Doesn't take long to think of that and realize, well, then what's the incentive to the owner to participate in the market? If they don't see anything, why would they do it? Why would they participate and generate that revenue? So then there was this idea of kind of partial fixed recovery where we say, all right, well, we'll allow the asset to recover 80% of its costs as a regulated asset. And then anything it earns in the market is subject to sharing with customers. You know, customers get 50%, 60%, probably going to need to determine that on a project by project basis. And then the asset owner, they, they keep their share and then may potentially earn above and beyond that 100%, but still have a net reduction in power cost because of those costs that are being returned to customers. Um, 
There's a hybrid approach that Kaiso came up with right before they canceled their proceeding that would basically, every time the asset participates in the market, they would reduce how much it earns. They would take that, that opportunity cost and impute that into their regulated recovery. So every time they participate in the market, the amount of guaranteed recovery they have as a transmission asset goes down. And then another one that we looked at was this idea of the cap and floor mechanism that's been used to support transmission development in the UK, where you, the asset gets just a, a, a floor, a, a regulatory recovery floor, where um, it's guaranteed at least a certain level of revenue based on unregulated recovery. And then it's allowed to participate in the market and anything it earns up to a certain cap, it keeps. And then, you know, shares with customers either anything above that or along the way. So I know that's a lot. Um, I, there's a link to the report there on dual use storage that we did. We're working on some follow-ups in this space as well. Um, our partners at Argon took this uh, dual use participation framework that we did and did a techno-economic analysis looking at uh, what a pump storage hydro facility could do as a dual use asset. So that's another good read as well. With that, I'm happy to take any questions and I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. That was great. Um, we do have a question here. We have many areas, particularly rural cooperatives that claim saturation of their distribution system due to net metered solar PV facilities. Uh, what are your thoughts on using transmission storage as a means to help alleviate saturation on the distribution system? Yeah, um, good idea. You know, it's that's obviously going to depend on a lot of factors. The it's going to depend on the configuration, the the structure of the the rural co-op in particular. Um, that's that's something that we've been looking at. Another project is not all co-ops are created equal. Um, but yeah, at a high level, yes, absolutely. You know, I kind of a, a good rule of thumb is the closer you can put a storage project to a substation, the more benefits you can get out of it. So if, if you can tap into that substation, then you can serve multiple distribution lines coming off of multiple distribution feeders. And so you know you how you use that, you know, you can you can use that to absorb, you know, back feeding before it gets into the substation. You can use that to, to increase interconnection capacity. Um, there's there's a lot of different things you can do with that, but yeah, at a high level, um, I, that, that is something that, that has been done. Okay, um, another more broad question. Uh, does energy storage as a transmission asset require grid forming inverters? Oh, that's probably a good question for way. Uh, I I would say yes. Well, I would say it can't hurt. You know, the important thing to keep in mind is that when it's acting as a transmission asset, the ISO is calling the shots. So the need for a grid forming inverter is maybe as strong because the ISO is seeing it and actively dispatching it. But you know, I, I think one of the key takeaways from Way's uh, presentation earlier is that we need all the grid forming inverters we can get. So, yeah. Great. Um, and then uh, just thinking about um, commissions uh, as they delegate on their various decisions, um, do you have any suggestions for regulators on questions that they could ask utilities that they regulate regarding whether storage is a transmission asset uh, would be beneficial for them? Yeah, and that's that's a great question. It's going to vary based on you know vertically integrated or, or market. Um, I think one thing that I would suggest for all all regulators, any state, any structure, um, keep an eye on transmission planning, uh, utility transmission planning, the regional transmission planning. Uh, when I was in the Was at the Washington Commission, that is not something we did at the time. We did not pay a lot of attention to it just because, you know, it's a regional thing subject to FERC. And so we would get briefed on it, but we were not active participants. And the more I learn about this, the more I regret that and wish I had been more actively involved. So that's what I would suggest starting, you know, and then just in terms of what those questions look like, it's going to vary. You know, if, if you're participating in a utility IRP, um, you know, there's, there's certainly opportunities to ask those questions along the way. Um, I, it's, it's kind of funny. I was participating in a, 
an unnamed utilities IRP advisory group back in about 2014, 2015. And they were retiring a fossil plant. And they were talking about how they needed to do 60, something like 60, 70 million dollars in upgrades to kind of patch the system back together after taking that plant out. And I asked, did you look at putting storage there to kind of fill that hole? And they they laughed at me. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. But like now we can see that's actually happening. And maybe in 2014, 2015, that was a laughable question because storage is really expensive, but $60 million is a lot of money. But I mean, that's just kind of an example, like look for those opportunities. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to encourage those analyses, whether that's an IRP advisory group, whether that's an ISO um, planning process, you know, your, your stakeholders in those proceedings, ask questions, encourage analyses, you know, um, if you're a state commission, you have you just have that authority, that ability to do that. And if you are participating in a regional transmission planning process, FERC has clearly given you the right to to request those types of analyses and request those types of information. So don't be afraid to exercise it. Great. Uh, I'll ask one more. Just thinking about uh, the extreme weather topic in, in Juliet's presentation. Um, can you speak to the performance of these storage assets during like extreme cold? Um, or extreme heat, but I'm more thinking about the cold and, and the impact on the uh, maybe the uh, duration of, of output and things like that. Are there any concerns there or what do we, what do we see from the performance of, of these uh, resources? Yeah, it's tough. Well, that's not that tough. It's going to vary a lot by technology. Most of what's out there is lithium ion. Um, my understanding is that lithium ion has actually done well in these really cold events because, you know, lithium ion puts out a lot of heat. Normally our problem is trying to cool it down, you know, having the HVAC to keep it cool and, you know, suck out, you know, take all that waste heat out. Um, so if, if it's cold in ambient temperature, then that's, that's actually really good for energy storage it actually gets a little more efficient because we don't have to put as much electricity in the HVAC system. There's limitations on that, you know, like if we're sub zero, then there might be some problems, but and I don't know off the top of my head what the the ideal operational range for a lithium ion system is, but I know I know it does go pretty low before it starts to have problems. Great. Well, I think we can go ahead and, and wrap up a little bit early today. Again, I want to just thank you, uh, Jeremy, for for your great presentation and thank the rest of the presenters today. And big thanks to PNL and, and Juliet again for all, all the work and pulling together these experts. Um, so thank you again. We we'll hope you'll join us um, on Tuesday, where we'll be teaming up with LBNL um, to look at uh, specifically continuing on what Jeremy covered, um, specifically looking at um, storage as a transmission, or excuse me, generator in interconnection. Um, so somewhat related, but hope you'll join us on Tuesday. And uh, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone.